So we have around 15 cases for today. So we'll start off with the first case. This is referred by Dr. Vivek Jain from Jaipur. This patient is a child with presented with one episode of right focal seizures, followed by transient hemiparesis. Uh, the child had fever for a few hours and was well afterwards. His echo was normal and the infection workup was normal. The CSF was not done at the time of uh, the, at the time the scan was sent. If Dr. Vivek is Jain, maybe you would like to add any further details of this patient. Okay. I'll just can go you on. hear me? Can you, can yeah, you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. So it's actually the history is so so uncomplicated and so simple that you one would wonder why to really discuss this case just by the history. So you know this child came to me in the OPD few days after this episode. Child was very well, no hemiparesis, and the history was three days before, few hours of fever, one episode of right focal seizure, transient hemiparesis, and just improved. And next two three days no fever. Parents just came to show me what could be the reason, and I saw thought of it like you know atypical febrile seizure uh, might it be, but just because he had hemiparesis, I did this MRI brain. Okay, so we'll go ahead with the MRI images. So here we have the MRI images. On the top is the axial diffusion weighted sequences, the ADC, and the T2 weighted sequences. And what you can use? He not yeah, have status. Did. Sorry, he didn't have status. So he didn't have a prolonged seizure. It was just five minutes, five to ten minutes. Okay. So in the MR, we have these multiple tiny punctate foci of restricted diffusion, predominantly in the left cerebral hemisphere, involving the white and some regions of the subparticle, juxtaparticle regions of, of the bilateral cerebral hemispheres, but predominantly the left cerebral hemisphere. The deep brain nuclei also seem to be affected on the both sides, more on the right. Posterior fossa structures, uh, that is the left, white, the left cerebellar hemispheres, including the white and gray matter, is involved. There is uh, was a small foci of restricted diffusion in the lower aspect of the medulla. And on the T2A sequences, you can appreciate the changes which were seen on the diffusion sequences. These punctate white punctate hyperintensities, which are seen in the bilateral cerebral hemispheres, more in the left cerebral and also in the posterior fossa. Moving on to the sagittal images, that is the T2 sagittals, you can appreciate the involvement of the corpus callosum. The inner and the middle aspects of the corpus callosum is involved. The callosoceptal interface is also involved. On the SWA images, I could not appreciate any areas of blooming to suggest a hemorrhagic foci or some areas of calcification. So what we have on imaging is the multiple tiny punctate regions of restricted diffusion cytotoxic edema likely is what I was thinking is possible vasculitis and uh, probably evaluate for the first infectious cause of vasculitis and also other cause of vasculitis, at least on the MR images is what I thought. So just to add there, uh, the child already had, uh, uh, you know, uh, some blood counts which were normal which were done on the okay. day this seizure happened. CRP was mildly raised. So the normal values we have is still 10. It was around 15. I just okay. couldn't convince family to get a CSF done uh, because I was worried about pneumococcal meningitis with uh, vasculitic phenomena. And mm -hmm. uh, they just came to me in the OPD because child was so well and they were more often wanted just a reassurance that everything is fine. And I just did the scan to more reassure them and myself. And then I found this. And then I just send them home on a seven days course of IV antibiotic and four days course of uh, IV steroids as well at the start because they just won't agree for a CSA. Okay. Uh, so I'd like to open it for the, for the panelists, uh, what they would think of the clinical and imaging aspects. I wonder yeah, whether yeah. it could be a transient phenomenon, whether you just uh, have a short uh, wait and see attitude and repeat imaging before doing any specific treatment is just a question because this is kind of an incidental finding isn't it uh, but it being diffusion restricted so it is acute and it corresponds to the event which has happened so calling it incident will you be uh, with you know there is an incident which has happened a significant incident in the child's life three days back and you have a diffusion restricted uh, lesions which are on the left side and the child has right focal seizure so it is causing the problem and here transient hemiparesis 
and all all the rest of the systemic examination etc is normal there's no other yes hmm. yeah so rest of the examination was uh, normal echo i did because of these punctate lesions which was normal there was no organomegaly uh, he mm -hmm. didn't have any organomegaly and his pulses were well palpable okay um on imaging these do have the feature of either embolic or small vessel infarct so either vasculitis or emboli which could be septic emboli so the two things that would have added to the workup here is of course a lumbar puncture with csf analysis and then on imaging we increasingly try to do uh, black blood or the so-called vessel wall imaging which is essentially a very thin slice one millimeter uh, sequence that is t1 based and look pre and post contrast and we're looking at the enhancement in the wall of the arteries particularly the larger arteries such as the supraclinoid carotids and middle and anterior and posterior cerebral arteries for evidence of uh, asymmetric or eccentric or concentric arterial wall enhancement that it would uh, further uh, increase the suspicion of uh, uh, vasculitis or inflammatory vasculopathy. Uh, I agree with Bruno that uh, the first appearance, the first thought when I saw this was an embolic phenomenon or a vasculitis. Uh, but Nihal, do you mind going to the sagittal? On the sagittal, I saw these lesions um that uh, evoked thoughts of a uh, metabolic condition uh, nihal rightly mentioned that it was involving the middle blade of the corpus callosum if i just look at this area the middle blade of the corpus callosum is specifically involved and that raises uh, the differentials for some mitochondriopathies but i would again like to stress that the diffusion weighted imaging is nowhere typical of a mitochondrial disorder it's unilateral and asymmetric. Uh, it is the involvement of the corpus callosum that triggered that thought in me, and I don't think it is 100% uh, that particular pathology, but something worth considering um, in the context that the middle blade of the corpus callosum is uh, involved in this condition. I think that there might be a component of uh, excitotoxic brain injury given the uh, the presence of these and these excitotoxic injuries tend to involve the glial component in the corpus callosum. Um, so I'm I'm thinking that it uh, might be one thing that uh, the clinical uh, uh, team might want to consider. The other thing is um, have they ruled out the possibility of a lymphoma, uh, for example, an intravascular um, lymphomatosis where you know we have microangiopathic changes. Again, this is low down in the order. Uh, I'm just uh, putting out some differentials, but just like Bruno mentioned, I would first consider infectious conditions, vasculitis or an embolic phenomenon. Yeah, these so are, Bruno, these are... a question to, question to you. You mentioned about the large arteries. Would you see small punctate lesions with a large artery vasculitis or it will be a larger infarct? Um, that, that's a good point we may see small uh, infarcts here and there and potentially if it's a systemic process the inflammation may be in arteries not necessarily in the territory of the of the infarct uh, of course uh, ajay made very good points you know we can work with the the operational differential diagnosis and then the academic discussion further to that and of course looking at callosal lesions should always uh, think of demyelinating and I made a note here that there were no demyelinating features despite the callosal lesions. They do not resemble the Dawson's fingers of the perivenular uh, distribution. We do see ischemic lesions in the callosum, particularly more posteriorly as their distal terminal branches of the anterior and posterior cerebral artery that variably supply that region. But here you do have uh, a somewhat random multifocal uh, distribution of lesions in the corpus callosum. So it is somewhat atypical in the context of vasculitis. Um, yeah, that's what I would like to add. 
So uh, Ajay, uh, I just a... wanted to mention, uh, we did, because my radiologist also mentioned about mitochondrial, so we did a blood lactate for that family, I can, so that was normal, but obviously that doesn't rule out mitochondriopathy. But would you still see so much asymmetry in a mitochondrial process that the left side is much more involved? See, if this was an older child, uh, callosal lesions is more like Suzik syndrome. You know, you see that in that condition, but uh, not in acute sort of situation. Uh, but yes, the asymmetry, will it be? Because you do see that asymmetry in Melas and Paul G, but not in any other yes. disorder. Yes. So the asymmetry yes. is not for mitochondrial cytopathy. Yeah, uh, that's why, I, uh, Dr. Jain, I was stressing that this is not what I would uh, say at the outset and readily consider. It is somewhere low down in the list of my considerations. Uh, it's just the th fact that it was involving the uh, middle third of the corpus callosum that that thought came to me. And you get it with Kern's sire, succinate dehydrogenase deficiencies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But usually these conditions tend to be bilateral and near symmetric. They tend to involve the middle cerebellar peduncles uh, and other areas uh, apart from the middle blade of the corpus callosum. So I wasn't uh, in any way suggesting to you that this was definitely a mitochondrial disorder. It's just a thought that came to me. Um, I take your point that this is unilateral asymmetric and the only mitochondrial condition that would evoke that sort of, uh, th uh, you know, uh, only Milas would evoke that sort of thought process. The others are they tend to be bilateral and near symmetric. Would an MRS? I doubt whether an MRS is going to add too much to what we already know. Uh, we might get to see a lactate doublet, uh, and we might see a low NA peak. NA creatine ratios might drop, but I'm not sure that uh, choline might show a marginal increase. But I don't know if it will actually pinpoint the diagnosis for you. Uh, Can I ask a question? Uh, this is uh, Dr. Kavita from Pune. Uh, Dr. Vivek, what uh, did you do the COVID antibody in this child? So, so interesting. I didn't do it. So you are right. I should have done it. Oh my! No, no, you are right. Because we had a recent so maybe... uh, kid who had this. Uh, I mean, they were not uh, such lacunar and small uh, diffusion restriction. They were quite mm -hmm. big, mostly in the uh, posterior circulation, and the COVID antibody was positive despite not having any uh, past history of uh, any acute febrile in infection in at least last six months. Neither the parents had any COVID infection. And this child has only COVID antibody positive, D-dimer at uh, more than 3,000, and he has uh, contrast enhancement on the V3 uh, portion of the vertebral artery on the left side, as well as bilateral uh, ICA. Uh, contrast enhancement, but there's no as such occlusion. The MRA is surprisingly normal. Only the vessel wall imaging, as Dr. Bruno pointed out, uh, showed contrast enhancement, and that is what uh, led us to uh, diagnose vasculitis. And only a positive thing was COVID antibody positive. So I think just consider that also. Yeah, I yeah. think that would have been very important. So and I missed CSF, the bus they have left. <laughs> yeah, CSF routine is normal. Uh, no other inflammatory markers. Even CSF IgG is normal. Thank you. And Thank you. That is useful. Have been described. The paper from Great Ormond Street Hospital uh, describes pleneal lesions in all four of the cases they had described in the beginning, but they were like COVID cases, not uh, not just post COVID. But but that uh, possibility always needs to be kept in this in today's uh, day, isn't it? Thank you. Thank you. So we'll move on to our next case. Case number two is referred from doc by Dr. Lokesh. It's a four year female child with slowly progressive cognitive and motor regression associated with dystonias. The child also had recurrent episodes of neurological abnormalities, initially started off in March 2021 as mild febrile illness. Over the progress of over the time of time period of eight months, uh, the child also had urinary incontinence, decreased appetite, weight gain, and expressive speech difficulty. Uh, this was in a gradual progression with weakness and stiffness of the <coughs> left lower limbs. At present, the child is unable to sit and hold her neck for the past one month and experiences excessive sleepiness and is unable to feed orally. Dr. Lokesh, do you want to add anything to it?
Okay, I'll just go through the scans. We have three sets of scans from March till October. So the investigations done were the CSF lactate, amino acids, organic acids were normal. Ophthalmology evaluation was normal. Ultrasound mm -hmm. abdomen was normal. There was elevated LDH. Uh, we'll go to the, the, the sequence, the genetic abnormalities after the, uh, the MR images. The NMO, MOG, NMDR antibodies were negative and the LDL, triglyceride, HDL ratio was increased. I'll just show the images first. So these are scans in March 2021. So we have the diffusion weighted sequences on top and ADC bottom and the T2 weighted sequences, actually images on the bottom panel. So you can appreciate uh, there are bilateral cavitatory lesions in the globus paradigm with some abnormal white matter changes in the central white matter. The brainstem also demonstrates abnormal changes, more symmetrical in the cerebral peduncles. There is peripheral area of restrictive diffusion. On the D2 weighted sequences, you can appreciate these hyper intense changes in the global paradigm, the brainstem, asymmetrically involving the, the pons, and here you can appreciate on the coronal images the extent of the lesions from the global paradigm to the brainstem. Flare T1s again these cavitative lesions in the deep brain nuclei and brainstem. There's, there was some small foci of restricted diffusion. Sorry, these are the SWA images which did not demonstrate any areas of blooming. Post contrast is peripheral enhancement, incomplete ring enhancement was seen in the involved structures. I'll move on to June 2021. Again, you have similar changes in the uh, global paradigm, but there's an additional area of restricted diffusion in the splenium of the corpus callosum. There's atrophy of the brain, which is probably a secondary to medication. And if you see the corpus callosum, which was uh, well described by Dr. Tarna, the middle brain of the corpus callosum is more predominantly involved. Here it is more confluent than what we've seen in our previous case. Flare and T1, again, these cavitatory lesions. Post contrast, again, peripheral enhancement is demonstrated. No areas of blooming or hemorrhage or calcification within the involved abnormal areas. Moving on to October 2021, as you can see that the abnormalities have progressed, now involving the anterior cerebral white matter, more confluently involving the corpus callosum. The deep gray nuclear changes have also progressed. So instant changes also have progressed. Mm -hmm. There is restricted diffusion in the corpus callosal and the frontal white matter abnormalities, whereas facilitated diffusion is demonstrated in the other areas. Again, the T2 and the players, these are the cavitated lesions in the deep gray nuclei. Involvement of the frontal, frontal cerebral white matter and the corpus callosum. And the subtitle images, again, you can appreciate the involvement of the middle brain of the corpus callosum. Spectroscopy, you have this liquid peak, uh, not a typical doublet peak, but it's a, a singlet peak around 1.3. The NA and creatinine are reduced, the choline is slightly elevated. Uh, there was the whole genome, the whole exome sequencing and the whole mitochondrial genome sequencing was normal. RANBP2 was also considered, which did not demonstrate any pathogenic variants. Based on the imaging findings, uh, the first probability is what we thought was a mitochondrial disorder. Looking at the involvement of the global paradigm, the PDH complex deficiency disorders usually, uh, um, usually affect the global paradigm. And also these uh, white matter changes, the confluent white matter changes in one the corpus callosum also have been described in mitochondrial leukodystrophies. Uh, less likely differentials were we thought was the frontal brain and X linked ALD and the RNBP2 which was excluded. So that's the case and uh, I'll open the case for discussion. Can we have comments from the experts? Well, um, let's just state the obvious that the pattern of mid-brain and, and basal ganglia involvement and later the corpus callosum, particularly the anterior aspect, they're quite suggestive of a mitochondrial encephalopathy. Uh, that first lesion in the splenium of the corpus callosum is completely nonspecific. It's just a secondary excitotoxic lesion. It wasn't probably the first manifestation of callosal involvement at the ovoid lesion in the midline in the splenium. We see that in febrile illness and, and several other states um, and the cavitating nature, the progressive nature, they all suggest mitochondrial encephalopathy. So it, 
it, it, it was somewhat puzzling to me that the genomic analysis was negative and I thought I have seen these cavitating lesions in the thalami and basal ganglia in a couple of very unique uh, mystery cases of Gaucher's disease, so some kind of lipid storage disorder that would go along with that elevated triglycerides um, and potentially gangliosidosis, although it's it's a multisystemic disorder. But I try to think about a, a, a the differential of a lipid storage disorder. Um, there is one case series that uh, I published in collaboration with the people at Great Ormond and Felicia Darko that has cavitating lesions with restricted diffusion that persisted in the thalami in a kid with non-neuronopathic uh, Gaucher's disease. And we thought it could be even due to the enzymatic replacement, although we couldn't prove it. Uh, am I correct, Bruno? Uh, I've seen that paper, but uh, you did not have genetic proof of this Gaucher. This was just a suspicion. Am I correct? No, the 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 two the three or four cases in they were all uh, Gaucher's. I think type three, the non neuronopathic. What we didn't have was biopsy of the brain lesions because they were found incidentally on the corner of the fumonized study of the spine. So the kids did not have neurologic impairment that would justify a brain biopsy, but they were uh, a confirmed Gaucher's disease. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to add to that. This is Kesh Mankat from Gosh. We did not have cavitation in those cases. I remember that series because I'd reported the scan, and it was the only one example of type 3 neuronal Gosh errors. I can't mm -hmm. remember cavitation happening in that to this extent. Mm -hmm. But I can go back and look yeah. at it. I'm on the back system right now. Mm -hmm. Would you have any other ideas, Kesh? No, I think the question really at this point is uh, how are you all working up for mitochondrial genomics and uh, are we considering a muscle biopsy or what are the other targets you might want to, what is the pathway? It's quite different across different countries in the world, I think at the moment. Lokesh, you want to respond? Dr. Lokesh? Sorry. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, muscle biopsies we are sending for the respiratory enzyme analysis at NIMHANS uh, when we don't get anything in the genetics. Uh, so we have found in uh, around 20 children the yield of genetics were around 50 percent or so, whereas with the muscle biopsy we had a yield of around 70 plus percentage. Currently there is uh, some issue. There is a delay in the respiratory enzyme analysis reports. It takes around two to three months period. Uh, for the reports to turn on, but uh, it has a very good sensitivity as compared to the uh, genetics. That's good. I saw the 3O methyl dopa elevation. What does that mean? Does it, is, is it indicative of some other uh, disorder in the background uh, that we are uh, not uh, normally speaking of, apart from cavitating uh, mitochondrial or cavitating lesions of the brain? Uh, where we consider mitochondrial disorders. There was this one parameter that was mentioned, which was 3O methyl dopa that was elevated. Yeah. So, so any thoughts on that? Like what the cause could be? Uh, I would probably leave it to Dr. Lokesh. I'm not sure what is the significance of the pre-metal dopa. Nihal, I'm just uh, yeah. googling what is 3O methyl dopa, which I had never heard of till this particular PDF came in front of my eyes. There is something yeah. called an AA, AADCD deficiency, aromatic amino decarboxylase deficiency of some sort. And uh, yeah, it's a neurotransmitter um, disorder. Okay. Neurotransmitter disorder. Uh, but generally, the MRIs are normal in most of the AADC. We never see these kind of abnormalities. And the phenotype is also not for that. They have very severe uh, uh, developmental delays and generalized dystonias. 
would we consider a multi system inflammatory disorder okay uh, uh, not sure this like kind uh, of hemophagocytic yes lymphohistiocytosis yeah hlh side of thing yes is possible but they have a lot of cerebellar involvement in association uh, uh, which uh, is unusually not much of cerebellar involvement in this child and it's too symmetrical to be a hlh dr tarnar yes 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 i think there is a paper out from gosh which uh, kish is on i think he, he might be able to throw some more light on this uh, i think he has another meeting so he may not be there uh, okay all right okay uh, i think we are getting a muscle biopsy done and uh, probably give a call up on the next meeting yeah it would be nice to have a call up yeah. Thank you. So, shall we move to the next case? Next. Yeah. Case three is from Dr. Kavita. Uh, Sahil. Uh, I don't know where this noise is coming from. Uh, Dr. Uh, Lokesh is actually driving. Uh, oh. So I'll, I'll go ahead with the case. Yes. So three and a half. Years. Yes. Okay. Sahil, go ahead. Can I continue? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. the child is three and a half year old with normal perinatal and developmental history. Actually, he was admitted with uh, in August with a mild respiratory illness, and it was uh, treated as pneumonia later. And he had repeated fever spikes. Then it was uh, evaluated, and he was COVID uh, positive with uh, raised inflammatory markers and treated as an MISC. Um, then he received uh, um, uh, methyl prednisolone injections and steroids for a month, and was later on discharged. Back in September again, he came with unprovoked generalized tonic-clonic seizures, and he was readmitted, uh, and uh, had, had received uh, meropenem and vancomycin along with one month uh, Dex also. So uh, the MRI, uh, so the inflammatory markers were uh, increased. He was uh, uh, COVID positive also, and uh, so we wanted to have a differential diagnosis uh, for this child. It's multi-inflammatory uh, uh, systemic uh, inflammatory syndrome associated with COVID. And in this child in you, September, because he had a seizure, the MRI was done. And from there, the story begins. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Nihal can show that MRI and then we can go for the further discussion. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just to highlight the labs, the LDH and the uh, liver enzymes were abnormally elevated. COVID was positive and uh, a skin punch biopsy was done. And uh, this demonstrated small vessel isophilic vasculitis. Uh, that, the... is later, Doc, that is oh, later, Nihal. Yeah, that yeah, is later. Yeah. yeah. First, we can go to that MRI uh, discussion. Sure, sure. So here we have the scans of September, the diffusion axials and the ADC uh, axials. As you can see, there are multiple uh, lesions involving the bilateral cerebral vestibule, predominantly the white matter, uh, demonstrating central areas of restricted diffusion and significant pen lesion edema. The T2 is again, you can appreciate the edematous changes and these uh, nodular lesions um, diffusely uh, ex extensively distributed in the bilateral cerebral hemisphere, predominantly on the parental aspects. The deep brain nuclei appear to be relatively spared. I think these are maybe some changes in the left basal ganglia. Post contrast, we have these uh, peripheral ring enhancement and some areas demonstrating complete nodular enhancement. The posterior fossa appears to be spared. Brainstem also, I could not appreciate any findings in the limited images which we had. And again in October, uh, yeah, so in September, on the basis of those images, he was diagnosed as multiple brain abscesses and was put on meropenem and vancomycin. Mm -hmm. And again, a course of steroids was given. Danny Hal, please continue. Okay. So October, again, we have these lesions. Maybe I think they are slightly smaller in, in size. I have not measured them. Um, the edema is maybe slightly reduced as compared to the scan in September. And again, you have these nodular peripheral ring enhancing thick uh, capsular lesions. And in November, Dr. Kavita, anything in the in between October and November? Yeah, so in November, they repeated the scan that what has happened to these lesions and they found that uh, many of them had uh, shrunken in size, but yeah. the edema that flare hyperintensities, uh, which uh, 
is supposed to uh, uh, mean edema here or still persistent yeah. after even two months of uh, antibiotic therapy and one month of steroids and now we developed a new problem which was a, a you know bilateral feet edema with a vasculitic kind of rash and that's punch biopsy showed this eosinophilic uh, vasculitis uh, changes okay. so uh, uh, we could not correlate you know those lesions with this but so whether there is a vasculitic kind of a process going on uh, at present when he came to us in november all his inflammatory markers were uh, within normal range so uh, that's why th we wanted to discuss this uh, mri like what does it what do these lesions actually signify are they uh, sig uh, uh, like signifying vasculitis or are they uh, you know some infected fungal and all those possibilities were kept but the child was absolutely fine, not having any fever, no focal deficits, nothing at all. Nothing to suggest an ongoing uh, infective process. So definitely um, the lesions have decreased from September to now. Uh, yeah, Dr. Padilla, please go. No, I was just going to ask whether other investigations like, let's say, CCT or HRCT of the chest and other things were done. Um, I'm just having a random thought of... Uh, would they be tuberculomas? Um, yeah, chest X-ray. Uh, uh, sorry, ma'am. Uh, chest X-ray was done initially, which had a mild pneumonia during that uh, MISC phase. But after that, it had been clear. So CT was not planned, and he did not have any respiratory symptoms. Also after that, MAN2 was done, which was negative. CSF routine uh, at this point also was negative when we did it in uh, November. Gene um, expert. Yeah, including gene yes, expert. Uh, oh, TB PCR was done actually. Yeah. So because you know we have a couple of cases where the X-ray chest has been normal, mantu has been negative, and when we got the HRCT chest, we found some lymph nodes and some small sort of miliary things. And because TB has sort of flared up in COVID, so this was a thought I just wanted to bring up. It might not be, but we also gave vancomycin and steroids and both of them can reduce the you know size of the lesion i mean the antibiotics per se can have an anti tubercular effect also so that that was uh, my concern but of course uh, let's go on to the experts what they think about this yeah thank you ma'am. yeah just to highlight uh, uh, like yeah dr Soros, please word i was going to make very basic consideration so AJ and Argen can uh, pick up from there. But if we look at the first few images, I don't know if we had the diffusion weighted imaging for the first series. Yeah. That's the. Uh, and you see that diffusion is restricted centrally, but in a heterogeneous pattern, a little bit atypical for what we see with pyogenic abscesses. Also, the capsule of these lesions was quite, quite thick. The lesions were solid and nodular and just later with necrosis. And obviously, extensive surrounding vasogenic edema that suggests infection. So here, there are enough atypical appearances to suggest granulomatous or fungal infection and in granulomatous including TB, as opposed to uh, just biogenic brain abscesses. That's, uh, that's the first consideration I would make. The enhancing rim of these lesions is always complete and annular, so these are not by any means uh, tumefactive demyelinating lesions. And, and then I'm a radiologist, but I wonder if the rash and the eosinophilic vasculitis could be a secondary phenomenon that happened later with this child, either because this is a parasitic infection or something related to treatment and immune response and not necessarily that these lesions are eosinophilic vasculitis because they are a little bit too rounded and not involving the cortex. I'm not absolutely sure that these are vasculitic infarcts. Uh, so actually, uh, we were uh, thinking of acting on that uh, skin biopsy report, but uh, meanwhile, one foot uh, uh, completely improved by itself. So we just waited and thought that, okay, let us see what happens if we don't do anything. And the second foot also improved completely. So the edema and the rash, everything just disappeared uh, in two weeks without any uh, you know, treatment. So then uh, what we have planned now is to just wait and watch and uh, maybe uh, we'll repeat a scan after six weeks again. 
but we just wanted to know like how strongly are we thinking of a fungal or a other uh, you know etiologies here um uh, because so uh, brain biopsy was planned but the parents were not willing uh, for the uh, could it uh, can can it not, not be um, neurocystis sarcosis can uh, disseminate it can it be neurocystis sarcosis disseminated um, sometimes you can do the serology for that no uh, yeah, we had planned for a, a repeat CSF and uh, actually we missed sending that EITB, but uh, we had planned for that. So that is already in the plan, but uh, the lesions were not very typical like a NCC. Uh, I would like to know from the experts whether still to consider so, that. Uh, so I'm glad somebody made that comment because in the beginning, even that crossed my mind that could it be NCC because you see that eccentric thing. Can we go back to the first images, the first uh, images? Yeah, so, yeah. you know, if you see the first images, you see this kind of eccentric uh, nodules and that's why, in fact, the first thing that came to my mind was neurocysticercosis till we heard the rest of the story. So, there's no way that you can, I mean, I there's no way I can say that this is not neurocysticercosis and we know that with all the steroid, etc., again, the edema can subside and uh, the serology if it comes positive it adds to the diagnosis if it comes negative it has no negative connotation that you can't exclude the diagnosis so that whether you send or not i mean had it come positive it would have been helpful but we've had absolutely disseminated neurocysticercosis with no serological evidence so that per se having it negative doesn't mean anything and then uh, we do know that, you know, with steroids, there may be resolution of lesions and uh, therefore it might have been a good idea if we could have got, gotten something uh, beyond that. Did we have an MRS by any chance? No. No, we didn't. Because sometimes MRS helps between tuberculomas, neurocystis, arcosis, fungal lesions, etc. Personally, I didn't think of these as biotinic. Um, had I thought about yeah, them? Yeah, they came then... actually, all these uh, MRIs were done outside. So we have planned for even MRS in the next uh, this thing. But uh, uh, does the uh, these uh, neuroimaging give any clue as to any particular uh, diagnosis over the other? Because all these uh, uh, ring enhancing TDs are there in our mind. Uh, but the only thing is we did not want to again give him steroids and then give albendazole because with so many lesions so we decided to just wait and watch but so, all Kavita, that is in the uh, plan yeah so kavita but something is he still on steroids can i speak kavita please 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 so something so interesting in this contrast image is this homogeneous uh, hyperintensity with surrounding hyperintensity as if this is gelatin in a perivascular space, you know, the cryptococcal meningitis, cryptococcal infections, which can have similar findings, but experts will probably mention uh, about it, uh, especially with a child who has received steroids for so long. So I have seen few cases, similar imaging findings with cryptococcal meningitis, especially who have had steroids. So there's no harm in doing blood latex for cryptococcal, which is quite sensitive, just a very uh, cheap test to do. So uh, what um, might be useful to see what others say about it. Uh, I would say absolutely. It... When we think granulomatous and fungal here, T tuberculosis and crypto are definitely at the top. And <laughs> adding a gradient echo or susceptibility weighted imaging to the MR, we would see calcified lesions, which usually are the end stage of cysticercosis. So we would it would help with. Uh, since now this kid has been at least partially treated and, and these lesions are evolving. Is this patient on steroids? Is he currently on steroids? No, sir. No, sir. Since last one month, he's off steroids. I think that would be a good uh, opportunity to rescan him when he's out of the effect of the steroids so we know what the baseline or the new baseline is going to be. Yeah, so this last scan is off steroids for one month. That's what uh, in November. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to make a point that there were some lesions that are waxing and waning. In that, by that I mean some of them were, if you consider these, who have a central caseous necrosis. On the sub, on the next scan, I thought they were not bright anymore, which meant that they're not, they have moved from 
solid to uh, from a liquid state to a solid state. So there is a, a lot of waxing and waning of the appearances. So what would that suggest? Uh... I'm, I'm suggesting that it doesn't follow the cycle of, uh, you know, from a non caseating to a solid caseation to a liquid caseation, which is the sequence of events that a tuberculoma follows. Okay. Could it be due to partial in up or uh, treatment, incomplete treatment? Yeah. Or yeah, it could be the treatment which is not actually directed towards the bug that is causing it. Another thing is uh, that I wanted to point out, which I forgot, was that the amount of edema is discordantly more in comparison to the size of the lesion. And I I personally think these are more um, infectious uh, lesions themselves rather than infectious lesions causing vasculitis and presenting like this. I thought that was your question. I beg your pardon if that was not your question. Yeah, yeah. Like we are confused. Like what are we dealing with? It's a, it's an infectious, uh, uh, like granulomas are related to infection or there are some vasculitic kind of processes going on. No, I, I agree with your first first uh, thought process that it is more likely an infection rather than an infectious complication. Okay, so probably the next scan will uh, clear us. I mean, make the things more clear, maybe. Hopefully, yes. Thank yes. you. CSF result was the sugar's quite low. CSF. Uh, initial, initial CSF. CSF what? CSF results. No, CSF is normal right now. No, initial, initial CSF. Did they so show? Initial in CSF so showed uh, uh, borderline high proteins, but there were uh, just 55 cells, so it was not even fitting in a very typical me bacterial meningitis kind of thing. The sugars were not. So proteins was I think 50 and cells were 55, so it was not really fitting in a. Uh, 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 acute yes. bacterial uh, kind of a picture. Yeah. Yeah. It was normal. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. I think we move on to our next case. Uh, I would just request the panelists and the experts to keep it uh, within 10 minutes so that we can cover all the cases. Just a small request. Yeah. Case four signed. Yes, so uh, a 14 year old uh, born of third degree non-consensus marriage with normal perinatal and developmental history. He had a, a severe headache and left sided weakness on um, 21st November. The child has a similar episode on in 2016. Uh, on examination, there is definitely a circumduction gait with eversion of left foot uh, with uh, good power tone and reflexes. So uh, vasculitis and stroke workup was normal. COVID was and also negative so this case there was a recurrent ischemic uh, uh, arterial ischemic strokes and uh, uh, since then the child has not had any uh, complaints so uh, the clinically they have given it as uh, vasculitis so we wanted to know if the it is not matching radiologically also and clinically also since the child has not had any further episodes also the uh, radiological findings uh, uh, will be I'll just show the scan. We have two sets of scans. Yes, sir. That's uh, 22nd November. And you can see that there is an impact in the right uh, MCA territory, predominantly involving the basal ganglia, and also in the watershed MCA PCA territory. It's a subacute impact. And on the T2 and players, you can appreciate the animatus changes. There are some foci of blooming on the SWA uh, images. The angio demonstrated this focal area of uh, narrowing in the proximal segment of the MCA. The neck uh, angiogram uh, did not demonstrate any abnormality. And there's a repeat scan on 3rd December. And you can see that the cytotoxic edema has now uh, changed into estrogenic edema. There is some area of uh, volume loss of the right basal ganglia. It is formed into a cavitatory lesion. There's a peripheral edema of hemocytal or blooming on the SWA sequences. The vessel wall contrast images, uh, you can appreciate that there's the, there is no significant enhancement. The MCA is still, the proximal segment is still narrowed. There's possible uh, formation of collaterals, though I'm not pretty sure on the static images. But uh, definitely there is no, uh, but there's no enhancement of the walls. Uh, it's not very significant to suggest of a vasculitic pattern. 
So probably think of focal cerebral arteriopathy as one of the possibilities and um, probably check for these uh, conditions related to it. And open the case to the panelists. <coughs> Any reason varicella infection? Uh, no, 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 it's pure uh, yeah. no, But uh, uh, what we were made to understand is that there is a uh, progressive occlusion of the MCA. Uh, so uh, initially it was, uh, I think, getting filled in the distal portion, and now uh, that flow is completely obliterated. So that is what we wanted to understand whether there is a progressive pathology here because focal arteriopathies usually would be like may, maybe a more, more of monophasic and uh, mm -hmm. here if we are having a progressive thing then yeah. whether it is vasculitis or like what kind of uh, inputs are there from the uh, etiology could we consider a unilateral moya moya syndrome mm -hmm. as a result of which we have a few collaterals in that uh, M1, M2 segment region of the right middle cerebral artery. I also see some vessels overlying the interpeduncular cistern, Nihal, which uh, could have, which could be some PL collaterals that have developed just below your arrow, just behind, if you come yeah, there, uh, in that uh, sort of V-shaped manner. Um, so is this some sort of unilateral Moya Moya syndrome secondary to whatever was the initial insert um, <laughs> Uh, is it is is that what we are dealing with? Is there a genetic basis behind this? Is also comes to my mind. Um, at my hospital, we had a similar case that turned out to be a Moya Moya syndrome, uh, secondary to RFN213 mutation. Uh, it was unilateral and just like this, and over a prolonged period of time, um, and just like I think it was Kavita who mentioned that a mono, it wasn't a monophasic, it was a uh, multiphasic it happened over several years and by the time the girl presented to us uh, there were multiple areas of cystic encephalomalacia yeah I, I agree with Ajay the labeling here I would suggest that instead of transient cerebral arteriopathy or focal cerebral arteriopathy that we label this as a unilateral steno occlusive vasculopathy because uh, then we would think about different um, differentials in the line of Moya Moya genetic. That includes obvious things like NF1 and Down syndrome, and of course, vasculitis, post-radiation, and uh, idiopathic Moya Moya, mostly in people of uh, Japanese descent. But I would, I would uh, move to that instead of just post-infectious transient cerebral arteriopathy. Can I make a comment as a barefooted clinician? I mean, in terms of prevalence, of course, all these are brilliant ideas, but whatever you call it, it's a matter of semantic, but focal cortical arteriopathy is common, is common. And unilateral moya moya in a 14 year old is not very common at all. So why not follow and see whether the follow up of these cases, this patient uh, fulfills the, the, the criteria rather than doing lots of expensive uh, fancy things which are unlikely to give a positive result and has no consequence at least today i i would say that late makes a lot of sense i think we're just uh interpreting this particular image that is being shown right now that seems to have collateral circulation as opposed to just concentric narrowing but uh, it's possible we, we may be over diagnosing it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, Dr. Kalita, we recently re-inspired one of these children, unilateral focal cerebral, so unilateral Moya Moya, who had two episodes of and one brief PIA. Uh, so I think uh, that image uh, might uh, make us think that we need to revascularize that hemisphere. Sure, sure. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Sahil, next case. So, uh, she, she is a 15 year old female, known case of idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, diagnosed six months back, presented with uh, severe headache and uh, diplopia uh, since three days. 
on examination there was a right uh, lateral rectus palsy tone power and reflexes were good uh, so her investigation panel wise cbc was normal this time with ophthalmic examination showing no papillary edema but definitely uh, right uh, left uh, lateral rectus palsy and her ana uh, into uh, if was negative so we had thought uh, there is, might be some intracranial uh, bleed uh, as she is a, a known case of itp presented with uh, ic bleed yeah <clears throat> I'll just show the images so you can straight away see that there is a, a heterogeneous pattern of uh, fluid fluid levels in the bilateral subdural spaces there is bilateral subdural collections along the anterior and lateral convexities and also in the superficial areas uh, we have, there are interspersed areas of t1 hyper intensities and iso intensity so it's a mixed pattern of uh, subdural bleed uh, few of the regions demonstrate restricted diffusion Along the posterior convexity, also you can appreciate there's a thin lining of subdural bleed. The SWI again, you can appreciate there are some areas of blooming on the SWI sequences, and also if you see there are tiny micro hemorrhages in the white matter, it predominantly was in the corpus callosum, the frontal white matter over there, and also in the MIP images, the micro hemorrhages are better appreciated, more centered in the corpus callosum and the periventricular region. So we have a case with mean, findings of bilateral subdural collections uh, with uh, multiple areas of punctate micro hemorrhages, no large intraparenchymal hemorrhage, uh, no press-like changes which are common in thrombocytopenic purpura. The I think it was a contrast veno and angio. Um, I could not find any uh, stenosis, but it's not very optimal. The cervical spine, I can appreciate this hyperintensities along the cervical, upper cervical cord. Um, these are fat sat images, so I'm not sure if these are bleeds or not. Uh, I found um, this review of literature with idiopathic thrombocytopic purpura presenting with subdural hemorrhages. Uh, microangiopathy, thrombotic microangiopathy is also a uh, common manifestation. Intracranial hemorrhage and press are the more common presentations for thrombocytopic purpura rather than the subdurals. Uh, so I'll, at this moment, I'll open the case for discussion. Any comments, Bruno, Ajay, Eugene? And what was intriguing to us was like uh, the left uh, lateral rectal palsy, though there was uh, nothing like a midline shift or any other, uh, uh, except for the headache, there was uh, not very uh, significant features of ways ICP. There was no other focal deficit. So, uh, is there any local uh, involvement near the sixth nerve, or is it just uh, to be explained by the ways ICP? That was the question. Nihal, can you show a sagittal? I, if you have yeah. a sagittal, I'm not very yeah. clear, but yeah, this is the sagittal I have. Yeah. You cannot see the cella is normal. Uh, Cella is normal. There's no tonsillar descent. Yeah. No. I wouldn't add to the description. Looks like uh, microangiopathy, thrombotic microangiopathy, and um, and subdural hematoma are probably related to ITP, and maybe uh, minor trauma could predispose that, but the ITP itself is probably responsible. Mm -hmm. Could there be anything related to, you know, bleed in the orbit or something to explain the lateral rectus paralysis? Did we do any dedicated orbital cuts? Or... Uh, I don't think so. We did an orbital sequence. No, we didn't Is do any the right or the left? Cuts. Uh, and it improved quite fast, actually. Uh, within one week, the improvement was there. So it looked like because of maybe raised ICP. But on these scans, there is no midline shift, nothing to actually suggest that uh, you should have yeah. the. Uh, so yeah. Was you able to do a CSF Plus, pressure? Uh, like, did you do a CSF pressure? Even though no, 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 the thrombocytopenia and all, uh, we didn't uh, do any CSF. No. Because yeah, initially the symptoms were like. Sorry? Because with the benign intracranial hypertension is a definite possibility with no lesion in pons you know with the left six even if there is no papillary edema did they buzz the child on steroids 
yeah she was on steroids because of the uh, itp thing but i think uh, she was on a very low dose so any child by dictum if you have a sixth nerve weakness with no lesion to explain bih is the most important possibility but you know doing an lp in a thrombo uh, itp situation would be a little uh, yeah, tricky clinically yeah but and also was there any papillary no 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 there was no papillary no, very CSF, we did not do CSF pressure, but uh, there was no papillary edema. We thought that the neuroimaging would be able to explain that, but there was uh, nothing on the thing to suggest any, uh, you know, stress or cerebral edema or even midline shift or a major bleed. Can and I ask if it was the right or the left? Left. 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 left okay. uh, rectus palsy. Left six now. All right. Can I make a point, ma'am? This is Dr. Prabhupada this side. Yeah, please. Yeah, last year we also had a child who had come with ITP and uh, signs of acute uh, decompensation kind of a thing with febrile illness. This child had also developed this similar kind of one-sided LR palsy and a little disorientation at the time of onset. And neuroimaging wise, we could also find only a uh, subarachnoid kind of uh, bleed which was encasing one entire hemisphere no as such multiple microangiopathic bleeds and all and this child also spontaneously recovered so we could not also explain what was the underlying mechanism but the presentation seems quite similar to your child here mm -hmm. that's interesting the only thing Maybe i can think of is that the too. subdural hemorrhage has probably transiently caused a downward shift of the brain stem and the sixth nerve has a course that is running upwards towards dorello's canal and therefore there could be a yank on the sixth nerve why the left is more affected than the right i'm not very sure which is why i asked you if it was the right subdural that was causing it then i could say yes it's more affecting the right but uh, just like i think it was abhishek who said when there is nothing uh, transient uh, downward displacement or uh, any sort of displacement for that matter of the brain stem can uh, affect the sixth nerve because of its um, uh, course in the cisterns and through Dorello's canal when it passes from CSF to dural uh, covered uh, tunnels. So that could be one and then the subsequent uh, improvement could be uh, once the new baseline has been established the child showed an improvement. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Can we move on to the next case? Yeah. Okay, six is from Dr. Lokesh. It was a neonate born to second degree consanguineous marriage. It was the only child, a term baby, and had no perinatal issues in terms of birth asphyxia. Later on, had respiratory distress with suspected sepsis and was placed under oxygen. On examination, was encephalopathic, microcephalic, had facial dysmorphism, and was hypertonic. The investigations, the ultrasound demonstrated bulky kidneys with particle cysts. Udico had a mild pH with small PD and MESD. The TMS uh, demonstrated mild elevation of the acetyl carnitines and elevation of the glycine. So here are the clinical pictures. If uh, Dr. Lokesh or Dr. want to describe or one of the neurologists, mm, that would be helpful. Yes. Yeah, in yeah, this uh, baby, you can see there's a return area and a long uh, and smooth uh, filter. And there is a hypertelorism and epicanthal folds also and broad uh, forehead there. And the skin lesions, what are these? Uh, those are due to high temperature, sir. Okay. Uh, due to warm. What are the clinical this one with sort of the stress? Uh, with the information on the ultrasound and the patient is not and uh, <clears throat> ultrasound was showing renal cortical cyst with the bulky kidneys, and uh, neurosonogram also showing uh, uh, cystic uh, lesions in the lateral ventricle. So clinically, uh, in the presence of the hypotonia, central hypotonia with the facial dysmorphism and the renal cortical cyst and uh, uh, conatal cyst in the lateral ventricle, we thought of uh, paroxysmal biogenesis disorders. Okay. And the sent for the brain for further uh, delineation. Yeah, I'll just show the images. Uh, so we have selected images of the T2 axials and on the T2 axials um, if you go through the perisylvan regions you can see as compared to the cortex in the frontal and the parietal occipital regions the slightly uh, ringed appearance of the perisylvan regions on both sides 
you see there is uh, some abnormality of the frontal horns of both the lateral ventricles the zoomed in image can uh, you can appreciate that there are subavoidable cysts on both sides the sagittal images are on the perisylvian region again you can appreciate uh, there is a jagged type appearance of the perisylvian region the t1s though not very clear again you see the perisylvian regions have a somewhat a small areas of micro polymicrogyria and the subappendable cysts are better appreciated over here again the coronals slightly abnormal cortex in the perisylvian region no abnormalities on the diffusion and no abnormalities on the swi sequences this is just a companion case which has a better uh, appreciation of the images the images are more clear the perisylvian polymicrogyria is a better appreciated over here and also some of the abnormal cysts are seen this was a case of a periopsisomal biogenesis disorder that is a zellweger syndrome Mm -hmm. Just to list out the main imaging findings which we had, um, perisylvian polymicrogyria, the list is um, long, but the common entity in the subapenemal cysts and the perisylvian polymicrogyria is the paroxysmal biogenesis disorders. So we are thinking radiologically in terms of uh, yeah, Zellweger syndrome and related defunctional bipotent disorders. I'd like to open uh, the case now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we can move on to the next slide. Okay. Case 7 uh, is from Dr. Ramesh. This child uh, had severe global developmental delay, facial dysmorphism, um, and severe alopecia, as you can see in the images. Dasha, do you want to describe the dysmorphic appearance or, or Dr. Lokesh? Abnormal skull shape, which is visible, but I'm not able to um, delineate the patient. There is caposet range. Yeah. And uh, there is uh, significant test parts here, whether it is uh, not shaving or this one, the HDR, I'm not generally. Uh, so, we are one of the criteria, but the skull shape may be the caposet range, which is uh, units. Could be positioned also. So I'll just show the images. Just selected images again, the supratentorial structures. Uh, cannot find any malformations, no focal lesions. The white matter appears normal. Deep brain nuclear also. This is a seven-month child. So deep brain nuclear also appears normal. Corpus callosum is normal. Brainstem is normal. If you come to the posterior fossa, the cerebellum is atrophic. As you can appreciate um, the asymmetrical appearance of atrophy on both sides. Coronal images better depict that, and the transition between the supratentorial normal brain volume and the posterior fossa with reduced brain volume. On the flare images, there is a degree of mild flare hyperintensities in the cortex. You can appreciate over here, and also in the vermis. So, what I could find is that there is cerebellar atrophy with a slight degree of particle hyperintensities on the flare images. And as we have Dr. Balthauser here, uh, these are these two seminal papers which are written by with Dr. Poretti and Dr. Bull. These are an increasing list of disorders with cerebellar atrophy and cerebellar cortex C2 hyperintensities. Um, I had shown this case to Dr. Balthauser, but I think uh, the constellation of imaging and clinical findings uh, are rather atypical and maybe not fit into any of these disorders, the known disorders with cerebellar atrophy and cortex hyperintensities. Mitochondrial can have alopecia with cerebral atrophy in significant failure to thrive. Uh, it's one hand and alopecia, sometimes an hypertrichosis as well with failure to thrive. But other ones. Uh... <laughs> Any comments from Eugene? Does the brainstem look uh, um, hypoplastic as well, partially in Nihal? Mm, Pons looks normal. I think I can appreciate the belly, maybe the midbrain slightly. I think that could be body matters. Does the child have any endocrinopathy or any eye findings? Any? Uh, not that I've known of. Okay. So we're dealing with a genetic disorder, but I'm not able to, uh, except the mitochondria, not able to match the genotype, phenotype. 
and the exam with mitochondrial uh, genome sequencing to probably would have been sent we should get done so Amish is not here today so thank you okay. any additional comment by the experts i don't have any additional comments in the presence of dr bolshauser he's probably had a look at this and uh, <laughs> I, think, I asked him first. I think the, imaging, the imaging for me is completely not specific. And uh, yeah, I think if anything will help is uh, genetic testing. Right. Don't know this right. constellation unless you think of a double trouble. So it will be nice to know the follow up of genetic testing in this time. Yes, ma'am. We'll get back to that. Yeah. Thank you. Can we move on to the next case? Yeah. Next case uh, is from Dr. Abhishek. This child presented with these multiple congenital uh, metastatic nevi uh, with hair in the scalp, the trunk. Sorry. So we have these multiple areas of uh, metastatic nevi with uh, hypertrichosis, I guess. Imaging, we have the diffusion and the T2 sequences. I could not appreciate any abnormality on the diffusion or the T2. But these are now again probably indicative and suggestive of the diagnosis. These are non contrast T1 uh, sequences, and you can appreciate that there is T1 hyperintensities involving the left cerebral hemisphere, probably the dorsal brainstem, some areas of the right cerebral hemisphere, maybe also the amygdala on both sides. The periaqueductal region over here again this abnormal T1 hyperintensity. So, uh, based on the clinical uh, picture and the imaging findings of uh, multifocal areas of T1 hyperintensities, this is just a companion case. The melanocytic neva is more extensive, and you have the hyperintensity on the pons. I would consider diagnosis of a congenital melanocytic neva or a neurocutaneous melanosis. My quick comment is that we, um, we know that because of the infiltration of the cerebellar cortex and potentially of the leptomeninges as well by melanin, it may uh, disrupt CSF circulation and development of the structures of the posterior fossa. And neurocutaneous melanosis can be a cause of posterior fossa arachnoid cysts and even uh, Dandy Walker malformation. So uh, I've had one case of a posterior fossa arachnoid cyst on a fetal MR that when the child was born, we found the congenital melanocytic nevi and had florid uh, neurocutaneous melanosis post birth. And I regret not having done the T1 weighted images for the fetal MR. I didn't mm -hmm. see the value of doing it, but uh, just to put that on the back of our minds, because to my knowledge, and we published this case report, but to my knowledge, there is no case of prenatal diagnosis of neurocutaneous melanosis by fetal MRI. So in the context of cystic abnormalities of the posterior fossa, to add T1 weighted imaging to the fetal MR. Yep, noted. Thank you, Dr. Swans. Thank you. Next case um, is a two-year-old child with mild development today, attained walking at the age of 18 months. Uh, speech had only bisyllables. Now presented with encephalopathy and respiratory distress uh, following mild gastroenteritis. The TMS was normal, whereas the urine GCMS demonstrated elevated 3-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate and had a normal lactate. Dr. Yeah. Location, the significance of yeah, this is a very yeah. hyperacute presentation uh, and background mild development still today and required ventilation for almost a week and then gradually recovered while recovering uh, had significant hypotonia with evolving dystonias. So based on the imaging, actually we thought uh, of a uh, metabolic disorder, small yeah. molecule disease versus a mitochondrial uh, disorder. Uh, but the TMS was normal completely. GCMS showed the evidence of ketosis. Not much of lactic acidosis. CSF was also normal. So we didn't have a handle from the metabolic workup. 
uh, towards the etiology diagnosis. Okay. I'll just show the images. And the images you yeah, have can appreciate that there is a, a bilateral symmetrical changes in the lower palladi and the big brain, demonstrating restricted diffusion. And also the dentate nucleus here, are, you can see that there are symmetrical hyperintense changes in the dentate nuclei. The main findings are um, bilateral hypercytoxic edema, changes in the global paradigm. I think this, this ADC sequence is artifactual, which is not seen on the DWI, and symmetrical changes in dentate nuclei with uh, some degree of cerebral volume loss. These are the T1s and the SWIs. Uh, Nothing very significant, just corresponding changes of the T2s and the diffusions. Spectroscopy was done, a multi-voxel spectroscopy with the uh, voxel in the basal ganglia and in the ventricle. So we had a lactate peak um, at around one the doublet peak over here. There's also a, the elevated peak around 2.2 to 2.3. Um, these usually stand for pyruvate or succinate, but I'm not very sure of the significance in our case, it can point towards a mitochondrial disorder, uh, maybe a PDH complex or a succinate diagenous complex deficiency. So here are the differentials which uh, on imaging, um, if you focus on the bilateral global paradigm changes, uh, PDH is one of the uh, uh, high, one of the differentials which is high on the list. Just to um, highlight the possibility of beta ketothialase, uh, these are a few case reports uh, and review of literature which demonstrated the bilateral global paradigm changes and also involving the brain stem. The posterior vitamin uh, changes are more common than the global paradigm, but um, it has been described. And the elevated hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate on the DCMS might point towards a beta ketothalase deficiency. So I would have mitochondrial and beta ketothalase based on the DCMS uh, as the possibilities for this one. Yeah, those are the two closest differentials. The genetics has been sent uh, uh, for the is better and they have been discharged. But we'll follow up in the next, uh, hopefully, in a month. Then we should have the genetic report. Any further comments? Yeah. Looks like Nihal has done a good job. He's gone through the whole thing. Next case, okay. please. Thank you. Next case. Case and against a two-year, three-month girl, born to second-degree consanguineous parents, was has, was third in birth order, was a preterm child with low birth weight, and had an NICU stay for 10 days with hemolytic anemia. Now presents with development delay, motor more than cognitive, microcephaly, facial dysmorphism with mild spasticity. Uh, there was no seizures, no extrapolable symptoms. The blood picture had uh, abnormalities in the form of neutrophilic leukocytosis, thrombocytopenia, dimorphic anemia, and acanthocytes. The nucleated RBCs and polychromatophils. Ultrasound abdomen had demonstrated calcified granuloma in the liver with mild hepatosplenic megaly. The ultrasound cranium demonstrated lenticostriate gastropathy on both sides. Bone myro biopsy uh, demonstrated trilineage hematopoiesis with fluoride erythroid hyperplasia. The echo uh, had sweet PD and a small inferior vena cava. I think those are the main findings and was sent for genetics with a and the possible differential of torch infection. Dr. Lokesh Dasrath, the patient dysmorphism uses retrogathia with uh, some degree of uh, microcephaly. Filtrum and uh, sposterly yeah. rotated ears and low set ears. Okay. So I'll go through the images first. On the axial T2s, you can appreciate that there is a significant supratentorial volume loss, a generalized volume loss. Deep brain nuclear structures uh, demonstrate normal appearance. Posterior postural structures also demonstrate normal appearance. No abnormality on the diffusion sequences. Flare also does not demonstrate any focal lesions. T2s, T1s, uh, again, no parenchymal abnormalities other than the significant volume loss of the supratentorial brain. What was the age? Two years, three months, right? So some posterior periventricular uh, changes, uh, probably terminal zones of myelination, some peninsular white matter abnormalities. On the sagittal, you can appreciate that the corpus callosum is thin. Cerebellar structures are relatively normal as compared to the supratentorial brain. The SWA sequences, I could not appreciate any foci of, of uh, blooming. Anjo also, I uh, could not find any abnormality and the spine sagittal also, I could not find any um, significant changes. 
so in the case the child was sent for genetics and these are the two possibilities which came out for a clinical exome sequence the spta1 which stands for uh, hereditary pyropapillocytosis and spherocytosis with erythrocytosis and the icardi guterase uh, phenotype of the icardi guterase syndrome 2 which stands which positive gene was rnas h2b the significant was uncertain of uncertain significance um, so i think this case is sent for a genotype phenotype match the prospective analysis i'll just cover the main features of the um, icardi guterase syndrome they present with these abnormal white matter changes, calcifications in the basal ganglia, white periventricular white matter, and also in the posterior fossa. This is a paper from CHOP again demonstrating the various areas where the aquatic uterus syndrome has calcification. There's a deep brain nuclei and the posterior fossa structures. And if you're just looking at the algorithmic pattern approach, uh, they present with hypomyelination of, and can also have temporal lobe cysts and atrophy. So in our case, at least on the imaging wise, I have only atrophy and uh, no other uh, changes to suggest an acardic uterus. Or will it be very specific for an acardic uterus? Did I miss the fundus? Was the fundus uh, fundus findings? Uh, I don't have the fundus. Um, Dasha, does it do you have the findings of the fundus? Because if you're thinking of torch or acardiogutri or anything of that sort, fundus examination would be very helpful. Okay, so no, uh, Dr. Neha, just out of interest, uh, the neuroacanthocytosis uh, syndromes, uh, what would they have imaging features as? Would they have any characteristic imaging features? As far as I know, no. maybe Dr. Taranath or Dr. Sorens want to take. I, I have not seen a case of neuroacanthocytosis so far in my life. If if this is one of them, this will be the first for me. Um, but as far as my knowledge goes, the neuroacanthocytosis is predominantly basal ganglia related uh, involvement. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know much about this. Uh, but all that I know is that it typically affects the basal ganglia. And it is, uh, I think I uh, could uh, show whether she develops any immunodeficiency type uh, in, I mean, whether she develops recurrent infections and things like that. And then it would, uh, with a hemolytic anemic picture with uh, an acanthocytosis, <laughs> maybe it will fix the picture in the long run. Uh, maybe it's too early. Uh, the one thing I would add to the MRI in this case is that this global brain atrophy, supratentorial brain atrophy that is so symmetric and without any lobar predominance or areas where the cortex is more affected, there is also no encephalomalacia or uh, leukoencephalopathy. So it resembles more just non-specific global atrophy or a neurodegenerative process as opposed to uh, torch a sequel of, of yeah. brain injury from infection and of course the lack of calcifications here it seems like we have a process that is predominantly affecting the supratentorial cortex yeah any seizures in the child no madam there are no seizures uh, predominantly uh, significant uh, uh, delay and mild uh, dysmorphism and uh, spasticity Okay. So um, the you probably just the parent. Yeah. yeah. Testing has been sent for uh, uh, segregation, uh, so we'll have that information. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on to our next case. This is a three-week child with a left lower motor neuron facial palsy, and had this left congenital orbicular swelling uh, pushing the around. So here is the external picture of the child. As you can see, there is a swelling in the periorbital region. So here we have the uh, MR images. We have the T2 axials and the T1 axials. So on the T2, uh, we have this heterogeneous appearing 
subcutaneous mass encroaching into the uh, middle ear and the inner ear cavity. If you see on the T2, it is heterogeneous, predominantly hyperintense along the peripheral aspect and some tubular areas of hypointensities more in the uh, more interiorly. And on the T1s, uh, you have these signal intensities of predominant fatty changes. The coronal images again heterogeneous appearance. The fat sat images you see that the fat is suppressed. So there is an extensive lipomatous component with some tubular structures uh, more centrally and on the post contrast images there is some irregular septal enhancement and the internal structures, the tubular structures also demonstrate some degree of enhancement more along the periphery. A CT scan was done and on the CT again you have these soft tissue and fatty components. The bone is slightly uh, remodeled, but it's not very aggressive. The periosteal reaction is not very aggressive, uh, at least in my opinion. And if you see the HU values, it has a fatty component and also uh, and also the soft tissue components. So based on the images, at least we, what we thought was a predominant fat-containing congenital tumor, probably a lipoblastoma or an infiltrating lipomatosis, uh, teratoma. Though we did not find any calcification, also was put based on the possibility. I'll just show you the histopath report. Uh, biopsy was done of the uh, lesion in the postural region. And I'm not sure how deep the biopsy uh, needle went, but what they showed was benign adipose tissue, negative for malignancy and lipoblast, atypical cells, mitosis, necrosis. Um, so I just wanted to uh, discuss if the, if the biopsy and the uh, imaging findings correlate. It is just a lipoma, benign lipoma, or is, some, is there something uh, more sick or malignant going on there? Any comments? Oh, very short. It does look like a congenital lipomatous lesion to me, as opposed to a lipomatous neoplasm. And it doesn't seem like it has intracranial extension to think about uh, more uh, neurocutaneous disorders such as. Uh, encephalocranial cutaneous yeah. lipomatosis. Um, okay. Ajay, anything? Has an ultrasound been done, uh, Nihat? Do you know if an ultrasound was done? It would be interesting to see what the ultrasound showed. Uh, sure. Were those vessels, uh, was there a high vascular density within it? Uh, I'm not aware of. Maybe Dashrath, any idea? No, sir, it's not a vascular structure an ultrasound. They showed just subcutaneous fat. Okay, and those cystic areas were just fluid containing areas? Mm -hmm. uh, I've not seen the ultrasound images, so maybe I'll just have a look. Yeah. Okay. Are, you, are you thinking of a venous malformation, AJ, with uh, lipomatous yeah. degeneration? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or even a, a, a sort of weird form of hemangioma, which is showing involution uh, changes, except for the fact that some atypicalities exist in the form of this T2 hyperintense tubular lesions in that uh, location. But there is a, a gray area between uh, hemangioma and venous malformation for an entity called verrucous hemangioma, which is still not characterized. A GLUT1 uh, stain might be helpful here um, to determine what it is. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. Next case. We move on to our next case. Um, if Dr. Rashmi can quickly summarize the findings, or I can do that. Maybe not. Um. Yeah. So this is um, this is a 11-month-old uh, baby who had a history of HIE grade two, so did not cry immediately after birth and had neonatal seizures, had a long course on NICU and was discharged on Levite Recitam. And, uh, and uh, the Levite Recitam was then uh, stopped. Uh, in the fifth month had an episode of focal status epilepticus and was again given phosphonate on Levite Recitam and discharged on Valproate and Levite Recitam. And at seven months, they came to me. I haven't met them until then. Uh, with global developmental delay, just partial neck holding, just making noises, and lots of increased tone and episodes of spasms going into the orthostatic posturing, and uh, 
Uh, the child has also got infantile spasm, so started on a course of uh, oral steroids, and on levitri currently on levetiracetam, valproate and anti-reflux treatment. Um, the EEG just is of epileptic encephalopathy. The whole, um, the lot of spi uh, continuous spikes and uh, waves are there. And CSF, calcium, and LFT, which were done during the uh, early age, were all normal. So initially, you know, it was um, thinking that uh, it could be straightforward uh, cerebral palsy. Uh, requested an MRI. However, the the features which are not against a straightforward cerebral palsy, suggesting a metabolic disorder, is something the I thought the ophisthotonic posturing was a bit unusual, like a dystonia or something like that. So um, I wanted to know um, uh, the MRI features, what uh, the panel thinks about the MRI. Um, okay. Do we have a, we don't have an acute imaging, right? Only the imaging at seven months. Yes, yes. Only the imaging at seven months when, they, when I first met them. Okay. So here we have the, the T2 axials on top. And the T2 axis, you can appreciate that there is some degree of volume loss, superficial volume loss, and also ventricular megaly. The mid and posterior putamen demonstrate a volume loss with uh, T2 hyperintensities, and also the thalami uh, demonstrate a uh, volume loss. Posterior fossa structures are normal. I can also appreciate that there is some periventricular hyperintensities, though for a seven month, it would be difficult to say if it is uh, myelination. Um, unmyelinated brain or if there's gliosis, but I can see there's reduced white matter in the posterior periventricular regions. Nothing on the diffusion and um, the flares again, I don't see the signal changing to seen on the T2s, but it is evident. T1s again, reduction in the volume of the middle posterior vitamin, but and the periventricular white matter. So that was, you can appreciate that there is a reduction in the Volume of the corpus callosum, the posterior and mid segments more than the anterior segments. Posterior posterior structures are demonstrate normal volume, no uh, foci of uh, normal blooming on the SWA sequences. Um, so, based on the images, at least I think uh, these are probably sequelae of the hypoxic ischemic uh, encephalopathy changes. Is this a progressive disorder uh, to suggest a genetic uh, probability? At least imaging wise, I could probably fit it into HIE sequelae. Okay. No, it's not uh, progressive. It's got a severe global developmental delay. Uh, I think our radiologist, I don't know if he's here, he felt okay. that uh, the ventricles were very symmetric uh, to call them as HIE because you would have a bit of, um, if there were scarring and all that, you would have asymmetric ventricles. Um, mm -hmm. That was one of the things he postulated. And he was okay. also saying that myelination is not um, like it should be if it were a simple, straightforward HIE. So these are the two things uh, our uh, radiologist was uh, pointing in the MRI brain scan. So I just wanted to. How know old what... is the child again? How old? Seven, seven months. Seven um, months. The child was seven months when this MRI was done, and now the child is nine months old. So uh, we see myelination in the posterior and anterior corpus callosum. So probably okay. I I would like to make two very short comments, and I would love to hear Dr. AJ. But um, my impression is that. Uh, the, the first thing is we talk about volume loss, but sometimes if you don't have a prior scan, you may not know if this child has ever developed that white matter volume. So I, I prefer the, the generic term, diminished white matter volume. And then these very small thalami, they are not gliotic, they're actually T2 hypo intense, a uh, very symmetric pattern. Uh, the shape of the ventricles also very symmetric. I, I am not entirely convinced that this is just a sequela of HIE. I'm not seeing very overt periventricular gliosis or or cortical injury. So, which pattern would you be dealing with? It doesn't look like profound hypoxia with basal ganglia injury. It doesn't look like prolonged partial asphyxia with cortical injury. So, I'll be concerned with a neurodegenerative process, particularly this small T2 hypointense thalami can be seen with metabolic disorder. I think GM1 ganglocytosis. Uh, I, I don't know if I can go deeper into the differential, but I'm concerned that the pattern doesn't fit classically HIE. I agree with Bruno uh, uh, Nihal that uh, the there is a ventricular sulcal discordance. You know, the ventricles are enlarged, but the sulci are not concordantly enlarged. It appears as though the ventricles are affected to a greater extent than the, vent and, than the pericerebral prominences. And another thing is, I think there is a component of benign enlargement of the subarachnoid spaces here, uh, which then brings the focus back onto why the ventricles are more enlarged than the 
circle spaces. So there is this ventricular circle uh, discordance. And I agree with Bruno that my first, I uh, when I looked at this case, my eyes straight away went to the dark appearance to the thalami. And once you, as you know, the dark appearance to the thalami raises the issues of metabolic uh, 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 etiology. Sorry. Yeah. So uh, as far as myelination goes, I, I I I can see myelination on the T1 weighted images in the genu as well as the splenium of the corpus callosum. The plicks are seen. Uh, so that is not um, um, the issue. I think it's the small thalami, small striatal nuclei as well, in addition to dark signal coming out of the thalami and ventricular circle discordance, all of which put together will go against a primary diagnosis of HIE sequelae. So I just want to mention something here. Uh, I think it's so suggestive of a HIE sequelae, this MRI. Uh, I agree with Nihal. Uh, this thalamic hypo intensity, you know, in the T2 sequence, we see so often in severe asphyxia, especially with T1 hyper intensity. Uh, people have tried to understand why that happens post hypoxia. Um, is there a hemorrhagic necrosis? Is there a hemosiderin deposition which stays? But this is common. This is common in hypoxic patients to have T2 hypo intensity with T1 hyper intensity. So it's not unusual at all. <laughs> So would you not consider a metabolic etiology? Not at all with this prominent ventricle yeah. because ventricle prominence okay. is just too odd for a metabolic disorder. This is suggestive of a decreased white matter myelin which is causing the ventricular prominence because of the previous hypoxic insult which is leading to secondary injury and this thalamus we should just because uh, I, I, I think we don't see this that often, often in Western countries. Somehow when I came back here to India, we saw it so often, this thalamic hypo-intensity on T2 in post-hypoxic patients. And that's not unusual at all. I have done, you know, in the initial years, I did uh, exomes and uh, mitochondrial sequencing, and they all came normal, and there was such clear history, and we were just taken away. And then I realized as soon as I, you know, over years, the pattern came became so obvious. And this is post hypoxia. I think Nihal will probably be able to put some more light on this. The thalamic hypointensity in hypoxia. Uh, can I make a short comment? I understand fully the the consideration by Bruno and AJ. I had also a look at these thalami, but on balance, I mean, this is a baby who had uh, difficulty at birth and is seizing since birth. So this is a severe refractory epilepsy. Uh, and it's not surprising that you have impaired uh, volume in a broad sense and that myelination is not adequate at all. So my balance also is rather not genetic. <coughs> yeah, we discussed the pattern of primary white matter injury in HIE. I tend to think that white matter injury happens more in, in preterm babies with HIE due to the vulnerability of the pre-oligodendrocytes, but some classifications define a primary white matter pattern in even in term babies, HIE. I have to say that I haven't identified this pattern uh, as a sequel of hypoxic ischemic injury, but it may be circular logic. Every time I see a case, I ask for a metabolic uh, workup. So uh, I really appreciate the input of people who are seeing that routinely, and I will also keep uh, looking for it. Important to collect cases that have negative metabolic workup, because I think what AJ and I are saying are not just our personal opinions, but it would be maybe the opinion of uh, a lot of our colleagues as well. So clearly there's some confusion in the field that we could help uh, sort out. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, I mean, many of us who see severe hypoxias do see these images, but uh, I must say that we've not got definite uh, metabolic workups negative to be able to say, <clears throat> was there any associated metabolic, um, you know, uh, problem. But for us, like for me, having seen so many hypoxias, uh, I didn't find it anything unusual. 
this whole clinical history and the imaging uh, but certainly i mean you know with new knowledge and new availability of new investigations if we can have a set of kids with this kind of radio imaging and then have a negative metabolic workup or a negative genetic workup if you may as a research project then that would help absolutely or at least stable clinical and and imaging follow-up would be really important to exclude that you're dealing with progressive disorder but I, I i truly appreciate the input can i make a final comment final for me uh, i think this is a good point but if you have treatment resistant epilepsy ongoing for a long time this leads to atrophy which is not uh, a proof of a degenerative condition but is just kind of the the, the byproduct of continuing seizing so this is not easy this to distinguish, I think. Yeah, and particularly I think if the child has received long-term steroids, then it makes it even worse, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. So, oh, so oh, good point. Yeah. They we haven't have received long-term steroids. I just started just now, just the two weeks. So yeah, no, have... I'm not talking about this child. I'm just saying if, when you have refractory ongoing seizures with atrophy, particularly if a child has received steroids, that makes it even more. So, yeah, we have to look at gray matter structure, particularly the hippocampus as well with prolonged seizures. And here it, it seemed to be predominantly a white matter process. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you yeah. everyone for your inputs. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Well, just quickly, um, we have uh, two cases. Uh, just quickly run over them. Prabhjot, if you're here. Yeah, hi. So yeah. this was a baby which I had seen at one month of life. So basically he had neonatal seizures on day two of life after a normal perinatal transition. So birth weight, gestation, everything was okay. And feeding was also okay on the first day of life. Had uh, seizures on day two of life, which had required mechanical ventilation. Baby was admitted for around 10 days, during which only the sepsis screen was positive. And unfortunately, the CSF was not done. And um, um, uh, following this, the baby was discharged. At one month, baby's examination was okay. And uh, I think Nihal will be sharing the images. Yeah. So the only query was, should we consider metabolic etiology or is it consistent with the viral infection at that time? Um, slightly uh, pixelated images, but these are the only scans, uh, sequences I have. Uh, and what date was it done, Prabhu? It was done Maybe. on... Uh, I think it was done on day 10 of life. Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll jump right into, I don't have the diffusion sequences. I have the ADCs and on the ADCs you can appreciate that there is um, edematous changes in the basal ganglia and also probably in the uh, lateral thalami and the white matter also demonstrates these uh, diffuse um, edematous changes if you see on the T2 weighted sequences. Again, edematous basal ganglia, thalami, and also the white matter, which is uh, causing expansion of the um, subadjacent to particle gare. Posterior poster structures, I would say, um, are relatively less affected. These are the um, T1s, T1 flares. Um, I don't appreciate anything significant. The main findings are on the ADC and the T2-weighted sequences. Um, I'm not sure if it fits a viral infection with such an extensive disease. Um, I'm not very sure of the diagnosis. But I would probably consider a metabolic disorder. Um, okay. Probably Dr. Suarez or Dr. Tharana. AJ. Uh, yeah, I was thinking of a metabolic uh, and not a viral infection, Nihal. Uh, yeah. Given the wide widespread and confluent involvement, I mean, the T2 hyperintensity of the supratentorium, which is yeah. diffuse without any lobar predilection and yeah. uh, confluent. I was thinking of vanishing white matter disease. I would also like to know if the child's uh, head circumference is, you know, um, yeah. greater than normal. And, you know, I'm thinking of megalencephalic leukoencephalopathy. Uh, yeah. Is there any peripheral hypotonia in which case I'm thinking, um, you know, correlate with creatine kinase and then think about Merosin deficient um, muscular dystrophy like situation. So these were some of the thoughts going through my head. So this what baby was 
one month now when was examined and this mri is of day 10 of life head circumference at birth as well as at one month of life was normal and um, okay. the examination wise baby is doing okay but probably it is too early to say <coughs> and you said the sepsis screen was positive sepsis screen was positive ma'am we weren't dealing with viral you know i mean in that sense did you mean or the screen positive i mean generally in a viral you won't get a sepsis screen positive so that is remember oh. more like the serial isn't it yeah did you do a uric acid and homocysteine not yet not yet not done exactly. and even the screening uh, metabolics that were done that they, they were done after the recovery so at one month of age ammonia lactate and tms was done because i was also thinking whether it is a sulfite oxidase or molybdenum cofactor deficiency that we are dealing with so i was considering that as a possibility hence the discussion uh, perhaps a pragmatic approach would be to wait and repeat an mri after a while after a few months and then see if the child is doing well of course if the child is symptomatic then you might have to repeat it earlier and do the metabolic workup etc but if a child is doing well you might want to do that what would you say probably mom follow up and see how the baby does and in case has a decompensation probably repeat the investigations also in that case absolutely thank you thank you hmm. Are we done? Or we have another case, Nihal, or are we through? Uh, couple of cases, but I can stop over here. They're pretty straightforward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'll probably stop because we are running over time. Yeah, we are already. Yeah. 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 So, Very interesting cases. Maybe we can keep the rest for the next uh, session. Maybe. Sure. That would be interesting when we have a follow up after ones that we've already discussed. Yeah. So I think it was a great session. And I would like to thank uh, Eugene, Bruno, Ajay for their valuable inputs. And we always learn from each other. So it's a great learning experience for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pratibha. Thank you, Nihal. Nice to see you, Ivan. Bruno, very nice to know you. I'm seeing you for the first time. Thank you. Thank you.